Hello and welcome. We are now going live for Purpose Live because I'm all about less talk, more action. And I do a weekly show, but I just sit there and give you guys practical advice. But a lot of times people start thinking like, what does this mean for my nonprofit? Or how do I apply this to my nonprofit? Or I'd like to actually see the sausage making behind the curtain. And one way for me to do that is to do that with you guys and show you exactly how we would go through and build one pagers and build mission statements and do some of this work and like really get the nitty gritty, like wordsmithing and all the things that go into doing this. But my hope for doing this is that you guys can see that this isn't difficult to really get your programs in a way, articulated in a way that other people go like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I want to fund this or, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I want to be part of this. Okay. So I'm going to roll an intro and then I'm going to introduce you to the first bold person that is going to be part of our lives. And we're going to build a one pager today for funding. Welcome, Lori. I'm so excited that you're here. If you could just give everyone, just a very brief um, introduction of who you are and your nonprofit, what you do. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I'm so excited for this opportunity. So hi, everyone. My name is Lori Bolin, and my nonprofit is Building Bridges to Recovery. We uh, help families of individuals who have an addiction of some sort, whether it's to um, substances, alcohol, gambling, pornography, any, anything, whatever like that, addiction of any sort. And what we do is we help the families get their lives back together and, so that they can then help their the person that they love also get on a path towards recovery. So recovery for the uh, family member, recovery for the person struggling, healing families and uniting them back together. I love this. I love this so much because if you've spent any time in the addiction space or you just know somebody um, that suffers from substance use disorder, you know that the family is so important and there's only so much we can do with rehabs or outpatient programs, but that support network is so important. So when you reached out, I was like, okay, totally fundable. I love this. So what we're going to do is dive right into um, building your funding one pager for your program. I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. You don't need to feel like you have to have the right answers because that's kind of the whole point, right? Is we're going to figure it out as we go. The one pager template that I'm going to share that um, it's the one that I give away for free. So if you guys um, want that one, this one pager template that we're actually going to be working in, it's a Google doc. You can go to forpurposelive.com slash page and grab that. Let's start with your project name. This is a workshop that I do. It's a 12 week workshop. Um, it's called, the name of it is, this is an acronym, BALM, B-A-L-M, stands for B-A Loving Mirror. BALM 12 Principles of Family Recovery. What I like to do is go on a separate part of this template and write out everything. We're going to come up with a bigger problem statement that you can fit into a nice succinct one pager, but you still want to capture all of that information because later when you're writing a grant for it or you need more language for it, you have it. Okay. So we don't want to be limited by the small little boxes we have. So you said B-A-L-M, BALM? Yes. BALM. Yep. 12 principles for family recovery. Do you have a tagline or something that would quickly get somebody to know like, oh, that's what this does. Like earlier when I was thinking about this, I was thinking like supporting families to support recovery or something like that. So I have two different things on my website. Um, tell me if you think either one of these are helpful. Um, short one, uh, helping families heal and unite. Longer one, restoring the peace and calm families crave in the midst of the chaos and confusion of addiction. And I think that we can get more succinct. What I want to do is create this shortened version so that I do want to include recovery or addiction or something in it, just because helping families heal and unite is a little broad. But I think that we can do that best after we go through all the other things. It will be really easy to make 
Uh, gotcha. What you said, supporting families, supporting recovery, that really, that resonated with me. If you want to put that on the list down there or oh, plug yeah. it in and see, see where we get. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Beautiful. So now that we have that, and just for people watching me go up and down and getting sick, this is just an example that goes with the, the template. So now that we have that, we're going to start with the problem. So let's get a problem statement. And the problem statement for this is really going to be, we would want to start with how prevalent addiction is. Two out of every three Americans affected, either directly or indirectly, by addiction. And the 2021 overdose statistics were, we lost over 109,000 Americans to overdose in 2021. Two out of three Americans are affected by addiction and over 109,000 lives were lost due to overdose in 2021. Um, okay, so I think people in general are pretty aware of the opiate crisis, aware of how bad addiction has gotten, mainly probably because two out of three Americans are affected by it. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to braid that point any more than that. What I would love to give here is a statistic or just some statement about why uh, people relapse or why even those who wish to um, enter recovery or want to change their life are not able to because of the support system. That's kind of the problem you're addressing, right? Okay. Yep. Yeah. I don't have the exact number. I would have to look it up. Mm -hmm. um, but you can just say like evidence suggests. On the, yes. On the SAMHSA website, you know, um, SAMHSA Substance mm -hmm. Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, they have a statistic of how much, what percentage of individuals get and stay in recovery is higher when the families are involved, when the families are in their own recovery program. 85% is what is sticking in my mind, but I that is not like written in stone without my double checking it. That's okay. You We can write it and then with a note for you to go back and make sure that's correct. Individuals are 85% more likely to be in sustained recovery when their families are also involved in recovery. And you can wordsmith that, however. I would rather say something about when their families are educated and equipped to support rather than that their families are in recovery. As much as somebody from the inside may know that they are probably codependent and they need just as much of, of, mm -hmm. of recovery, I, I as a person might, I could see myself going, well, I don't need recovery. My, my, you know, my life is great. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that is something we hear a lot. If you said to me, oh, oh, I know, Rebecca, but we just want to equip you to deal with and to support this other person that is in recovery, then I'd go, oh, okay, I'll do it for him. I won't do it for me. That makes perfect sense. Individuals are 85% more likely to be in sustained recovery when their families in, are educated and equipped to support them. So as much as this is a great thing, to me, this is more of the solution. So I'd still love to figure out if can we can we invert this in any way to say individuals are 85% less likely to sustain recovery? Hmm. That's a good thought. Yeah. Okay. Just because it's like 85 of these people are gonna fail if we don't get their family the support. Exactly. I don't know that we need this. And I actually like how short and succinct this is because it's going to really help you. But I think that we could go further in the problem in saying what happens when somebody doesn't get help? What happens when somebody remains in there? And then this is like more likely to be incarcerated, um, experience homelessness. I'm going to say commit crimes because that would be something that the public would care about. Without recovery and healthy support systems, individuals are more likely to commit crimes, be incarcerated, experience homelessness, and early death. You know, when you're writing different funding proposals, sometimes they let you really explain the problem. Sometimes you need to do really quick, whatever. So this first one, good enough for a one pager. But it's always nice to say like, okay, so if we just let this problem go and we do not implement your program, what are we looking at here? Another thing you could do for the problem 
that's if it was specific to your area and you knew that you were trying to find funding to your area, you could definitely say in this county, the prisons are overrun. Um, we're seeing more and more. I don't know if you knew that the, the members of your community didn't like that there were homeless people panhandling or whatever. Like there's you can use some of that to say this is a direct consequence of these people not getting the support that they need. Good. Okay, so anytime that you're, you know, building a funding one pager or building your funding proposal, just thinking about what's the what's the real problem of this for the person that's going to read this. If you know you're speaking to somebody that's in your county that doesn't like that crime has increased and you can make the case like, well, listen, if they had supportive families and we could help them in recovery, then this is really that that grassroots or upstream effort to get crime reduced here. Good. You can start as many crime watches as you want, but until we get, you know what I mean? So that's kind of how you're making the case. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Okay. So that's the problem. Now we get to go into the solution, which is of course everybody's favorite part. Let's just go with whatever your uh, program is. So our BOMB 12 Principles for Family Recovery Program is a 12-week, that's right, right? Yes. Is it immersive? Like, what is it? Is it online? Is it cohort? Um, it is online. The way I describe it is it's an interactive workshop. Okay, so our BOMB 12 Principles for Family Recovery Program is a 12-week interactive workshop for families with loved ones experiencing substance use disorder? Or is it more than that? Are they with loved ones in active recovery? Are they, what's the criteria for entry? That they love someone with a substance use disorder. Okay, so that person could or could not be seeking recovery or in active. Cor correct. Just because I'm curious, what is the percentage of people that are like, they've gone to rehab and now we want recovery or they're just like, listen, he's an addict and I need to start dealing with him going to prison or possibly dying and I, I want. Yeah, the, the, um, the vast majority, 90% or more, the person is still active in their addiction. Okay. And the family is, what do I do? That's really good to know because I want to know, I, I almost like it more as a funder knowing that you know what the family is stepping up understanding that the person may not be able to right now but the family's stepping up getting the support they need and that might be the catalyst for them getting the help that they need um, rather than only helping people who um, have a loved one that has actively chosen recovery i feel like that's um that's important that you're open to both our be a loving mirror 12 Principles for Family Recovery Program. Okay, so I'm just going to say, and don't get mad at me for changing it. You know, you own this document. So our Be a Loving Mirror Family Recovery Program is a 12-week interactive workshop for families with loved ones experience substance use disorder. It follows a 12 principle evidence-based, I'm going to just guess that, it is, yes. Okay. Family recovery model, curriculum. It is a 12 principle evidence-based curriculum. I want to say provides, because the program isn't the curriculum. To ensure what is, what's the outcome? You'll learn how to move from denial to awareness, uh, regain lost inner calm, and achieve peace in your home effectively communicate with your loved one without judgment or anger, use boundaries and leverage effectively and lovingly, become aware of stages of change in your loved one and yourself, use motivational interviewing, get support, heal relationships, be your loved one's best chance at recovery. I think that that's great. Um, it, it's it's a um, good detail for the parent that's going to join this. Mm -hmm. um, this workshop provides a 12 principle evidence-based curriculum to promote healing, effective communication, and peace in families affected by addiction by equipping families with their own emotional awareness, communication strategies. You said stages of change. Do you teach them about 
what addiction is and what it looks like and how it behaves? Yes. Okay. Emotional awareness, addiction education, and communication strategies. We position or they are positioned to be their loved one's best chance at entering and sustaining recovery. How does that sound? Perfect. I love it. Yay! Okay, that's you. That's what you do. Love that. So let's go right into impact metrics because I think that what we can use is some of these things that you said. Denial, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically, when we come up with impact metrics, we um, want to understand what our outcomes are. We start with what outcomes do we want to have, and then we figure out how can we measure those. So you did just list off some outcomes. Ideally, we would understand, um, and this is, could easily be done with a, a survey at the end or pre-post test, um, but about emotional awareness or, you know, you don't have to use what you use in your funding one pager. It can, mm -hmm. Your funding one pager is just kind of to tell people, but we know emotional awareness can mean a whole lot of things. So if you can actually track this whole like from denial to awareness, then that would be a good outcome to have um, percentage of participants reporting that they have a more of a sense of peace in their home. And that one's really cool because it could be regardless if anything externally has changed. Correct. You yes. know? So that one's really neat because it's like, oh, we're not saying your home will look more peaceful. You will just have more peace in it. So communications, we can certainly do that. We can definitely test them on their knowledge of st stages of change and um, test them on their knowledge of motivational interviewing. I'm just trying to think a little further out. So this data is like right at the end of the program. This is what they get, which is great. Mm -hmm. But outcomes um, typically are like, how do they use what they learn in the program moving forward? So this might be a three month follow up survey. It might be a six month follow up survey, just asking about maybe the same exact things, but were they able to sustain what they learned? I don't know that it would be worth it. I mean, I think it would be worth it to track how many participants of this program had the loved one actually, you know, seek recovery. But I don't think it's indicative of whether or not your program is useful. If 3% of people actually sought recovery, I don't know that we can say that's because or that they didn't because of yours. Let's see what would matter the most to funders. So you're definitely going to do how many enrolled? Generally six to 12. So actually- That is kind of our sweet spot, which is about where we land every time. So I actually think part of your solution, this workshop provides each cohort is um, limited to, you said 10 was your sweet spot? Yes. 10 uh, members. Now, if it's a husband and a wife. Yeah, we say families because we count a husband and a wife as one. One. Okay, per perfect. Families who promote participation and want to say something about something that the intimate environment promotes. Each cohort is limited to approximately 10 families to promote participation. An intimate environment allows participants to share freely and gain the most out of their experience. That way we don't get in this, uh, you know, I love it when people have an answer and they're intentional about everything they do. So if a funder says like, well, this is great, but like, could we open it to 30 families? You know, it's online. What's the, and, and you have an answer. Actually, we find like we've done this, we did it with six. It didn't work. We did it with more than 12. And we felt like people weren't getting the most out of this. So this is our sweet spot for a reason. So calling things out. And then every time you have an answer like that, it's like, oh, okay, Lori knows what she's talking about. She method to her madness. So we can have the number enrolled. Do you ever have a wait list? Not yet. Okay. Number enrolled. Percent of participants reporting a greater sense of 
uh, what do we call it? I don't want to call it addiction awareness, but it's not just of awareness. It's like, of, or it's like reality. Uh, yes. Yeah, there is that. A few of the things we get the most feedback on at our end of workshop survey is a greater sense of peace within themselves, no matter what their loved one is doing, increased um, communication within the family unit. And I don't know how you measure this, but um, people really appreciate the tools, resources, strategies, whatever you want to call them, that they learn because we practice them. So I would say percent of participants reporting a greater sense of internal peace, percent of participants reporting increased positive communication within the family, percent of participants reporting um, resources being useful. Another thing you can do is percent of participants reporting actually like using resources. So it's one thing to say like, oh, this, these are great. It's another thing like, nope, I took your one pager and I actually used it. Mm -hmm. yep. Reporting practical application of resources. So that's plenty of metrics for this section, but these are all things that you can make questions around. So typically when you're making survey questions, you don't want anything double barreled. So it's the reason why I didn't do percent of participants reporting tools and resources being useful because somebody could say, well, the tools were great, mm -hmm. but the resources weren't. So you want to just limit it to one thing. I feel like if you say resources, people are probably going to think of the things you gave them that they could use. Okay. Um, so just using the language that you think is going to get you the answer that you want the most. And then ideally you would also like shoot for something like 80%, you know, you'd set a target. But for the funder, you can say, we will report back on this at the end of each cohort. Now, this percent of participants reporting practical application of the resources, if it's like they're actually using the resources within the 12 weeks, then you can ask this right at the end. I think it would be great if you could come up with some type of three-month follow-up or you know some follow-up survey that just says, where are you at now? Should we do a like a 30 day follow up, a 90 day follow up? Well, what I think is one, don't collect data you're not gonna use. Two, incentivize data collection. So not just, hey, here's a survey, we need something for us, but hey, we really wanna know how your family's doing and we'd love to provide you more resources. Where are you at? The best way to do this is in, in, an, in an interview style so you actually call the families, you have an interview protocol. So you have, which just means you have some questions on a Google doc that you ask every single person that you call, but you really are reaching out. I like to start these with like, Hey, how are you doing? What do you need? Where are you at? A very human conversation. And during that, you're kind of getting some of your questions answered. And then you are providing any follow-up resources that you can. Then you use that to inform future programming. So you might say, well, we need the next steps program um, or beyond the 12 steps program, you know, whatever, or people are needing more things and what are they, so that you use that for program. And then you can also ask a question in that interview. That's like, oh, that's interesting. So we're hearing, you know, five different families say that this happened, this has happened since, or they maybe stopped the communication or there was something that wasn't helpful is there something you can implement in the 12 weeks, like an action plan for the next, you know, you, you might already do that, but something that can kind of preempt what you're seeing people have problems with after the program. Got it. Okay. So my biggest thing about everything is purpose, 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 purpose. So yes, our, our three months, six months, da, 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 are all of these things cool? They can be if you get data, but so often we just create a survey and we send it out and then we go, you know, a year later, I come back as an evaluator and I say, okay, what does our data look like? And they're like, two people answered the survey out of the whole year. So one, we don't even have enough data to do anything with or to report back to the funder, but we just didn't do it well. We just thought, oh, we'll just do it in these time sense and we'll send out a survey. I would rather you only collect data one time after, but have it be meaningful, not only for, for you, but you're really serving the people and saying, we didn't just leave you. We were thinking about getting pulling the group back together as a follow-up, but I heard you say one-on-one -on -one phone call. So do you find that more impactful? I think that pulling the whole group back together, if you could do it, would be great. And basically what you could do with that 
is a focus group type setting where you're still using a question protocol, but you are asking the whole group and the whole group is kind of saying their open-ended answers. And, but you have something that's prompting you to collect the data that you need to collect. All right. Thank you for that. And I love that because it's one hour of your time or two hours of your time versus all these individual conversations. I don't think one is better than the other. You know, you have different issues with one. One might be only two of the families come back to the group thing. And so it's really what works for you to get the most data and for people to feel like you're serving them the most. Anytime that you get a nugget from data or you get, wow, we hear this from our families and we're going to change this. Don't do it behind closed doors. Send an email out, tell people like, because of what you shared with us, we're changing it to this year. Here's our new tool. We're going to give it to the new cohort. We wanted to make sure we're giving it to, you know, the older cohorts. And this is because of you. Thank you so much. Because people always think that they give feedback and nobody does anything with it. And the mm -hmm. truth is, is that's probably right. And it's beautiful content. Like it's a beautiful way to show people that you care and have another communication with them. Okay. So we know that funding needed is 25,000. Now it would be cool for your program. You could tell the funder that it's 25,000 and that they could release it to you in uh, $6,250 increments. So if they wanted they could give you the $6,250. You could run your first cohort. You send reporting back. But to them, it's like you're ready to kind of work with them and show them what you're willing to do. Just because the $25,000 covers four very specific cohorts, Correct. I think that that's like a nice payment structure, um, especially to build trust. And if you pitch it and it works for you, um, it can also add to a whole bunch of things, sustainability and all that. So tell me what the... 25,000 will get, or what does each cohort, like what, what makes it cost $6,250? Well, they get the, the 12 week workshop, some supplies like a book, a workbook, a journal, a notebook, a dedicated staff member that leads the group or facilitates it. Uh, yeah. Well, that's me. Yeah. A notebook, a journal. Each of the participants get program supplies including a, what is the book? Um, it's called Balm, The Loving Path to Family Recovery. Including the Balm curriculum, workbook. I'm just going to say and journal. Each week they get um, a handout that they can print for their notebook. It's a summary of what was taught in the workshop that week. Are you like credentialed in any way? Yes. Through the International Coach Federation. Okay, so I'm saying each week participants get a dedicated credentialed staff facilitator and program resources for their practical application outside. So the reason why I'm saying this is it's nice to know that what they're learning inside the workshop is applied outside mm -hmm. of the workshop mm -hmm. um, for their practical application. I'm going to say in everyday life instead of outside of the workshop. The 12-week program costs... $6,250 $6, and only $25,000 per year for 40 families who, what about regain well-being and support their loved ones? Okay, that covers both. And then the last part is why us? Why should we trust that you are the best organization to do this? How long have you been in business? Five years. What made you start this? And I can actually look up your website. Sometimes what I do is like go to an about section that just says what bridges to recovery is and i put it in chat gpt and say make this better what i say on my about page is my life has been touched deeply by substance use disorder um, having lived with sud my entire life i understand the chaos the confusion the desperation family members feel because i've been there i also know the peace the clarity and the hope I don't know how personal do you want it to be? So what I would say as a funder is I would want to say, how long have you been doing these support groups? Three years. Tell me more about Be a Loving Mirror. What's that about? Well, the reason why is because it's not easy to wrap my head around. When I see BOM Family Recovery Program, mm -hmm. and then I go, okay, what does that stand for? And then you say Be a Loving Mirror. I, I just expect that you're like, because I feel like you need to lead by example and you need to, da, 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 like whatever the loving mirror part is, 
or we can change the name of it. But like, there's a reason why you named it Bong. Well, yeah, there is because it's um, it's uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's it's proprietary to the family recovery coach training that I received. Okay. So okay. that. So not only am I certified by the International Coach Federation, but also by the BOM to present this program. Okay, so I don't know that BOM is a thing. I just thought it was like a nice little name you came up with. But now that I know this, I would say using their uh, BOM recovery program, BOM, or should we say like Lori is certified in BOM or BOM is an evidence-based? Uh, both are true. Mom is an evidence-based family support modality that Lori is certified in or mm -hmm. yep. Lori's personal experience with substance use disorder led her to when you were struggling, mm -hmm. did you, what helped you out of darkness? Was it anything like the only reason I say that is because sometimes it's like, your personal testimony that this was helpful for you. If you don't have that, we don't need to mention it. Mm -hmm. No, it's fine. Yeah. It, I mean, it was this, I mean, it's, I started in Al-Anon and Al-Anon friend introduced me to the balm and the, the balm was what was instrumental in my personal family recovery, which is why I then decided to go through the training. I really just want to say this inspired you to give this to other families. So due to her own family's experience, Lori sought help and found bomb recovery services. Maybe this will help you because I say this often is that um, finding the bomb gave me my family back. Even while my, my particular, my specific loved one who happens to be my daughter was still using. Lori attributes bomb to giving her, her family back in their own with substance use disorder. It is now her personal mission to share this resource with. That makes me go like, okay, she used this. It's so much better than just like, oh, I got a certification and I kind of wanted to go into this as my career. This is the Canva template that everyone can use. Actually, this is not, this is the $7 one. So it's a little pricey, but anyway. Okay, so let's just use this. Is your brand colors kind of like this plum? Um, Yes. Okay. So let's just make the background a plum color, which you can go in and kind of change this a little bit. I bought this template. So I can do this. Okay, cool. So you're just going to want to use, and you know, this is where you get to have fun going into your elements and um, dragging over mm -hmm. what yeah. your support groups look like and adding all of this plum stuff. It's pretty easy. You would just copy and paste and you can, because you already got this one, you know, you can choose one that looks different. You don't have to choose this one, but then you would pop it all in really just copy and paste whatever we did. Now what, right? Is the big thing. Are you confident in once you have this all copied and pasted into your template, do you know what you're going to do next with it? I would love to say yes, but no, because this is the thing. It's like, cool. I made a one pager. Right. And then you're like, anybody want to read it the best approach to do is you get these one pagers done and then you go to your board and then you have your board each identify five people and i would make a spreadsheet to hold everybody accountable so i'd make a spreadsheet with all the names and then in the second column i would write who's assigned to that person and then did they reach out and when and it is not sending it and saying hey will you fund this it is just fun sending it and I think that you actually got, in one of the emails you got for me, it said it showed the actual copy and paste email you would send to these people. But it just says, hey, I know you care so much about recovery. Da -da -da. Like, we would love your input. If you were reading this as a funder, you know, what should we change? I'd love to hear your feedback. Can we hop on a call? So your board members reach out to five people and just say, listen, I'm on the board of this nonprofit. We're really trying to get funding. We've been having a hard time. I know you care so much about recovery. It's a big problem in our area. Um, we created this one pager and we want to start having some conversations. We just want to get some feedback. Like we're not looking for you to fund it, but we're just looking like, does this make sense to you? Are we on the right track? Then when you get on that phone call mm -hmm. with those people, those five people, 
you just say, hey, how does this look? You take their feedback, you listen. And at the end, you do say, do you know anyone in your network, a business owner, a church, um, or an individual? Do you know anybody that this is really aligned with like their giving or that they would want to know about this? Because I'd love to reach out to them. Then you're starting to grow your network a little bit more. Um, and so if everybody has those five conversations, then you're really just nurturing relationships and having conversation starters around this. And you're also hearing any objections they might have. So they might say, well, this doesn't make sense to me. Or, well, you know, I'd love to, I would love to fund a week. So they take the, you know, 6250, we divide it by 12. I'll give you $520 to support one week. And then you're like, okay, well, maybe that's more approachable for people. So they're going to do. So it's really just figuring out who your network is. And it's getting your board ready to like get excited about your programs. You're equipping them with something like this is what we do, guys. This is why us. This is very little ask of money for the outcomes we're getting. And it gets your board bought in and equips them and lets them have conversations that is not asking for money, but just like just starting the conversation. I love you that. You think you can do that? I love that. Yes, we can do that. Okay. All right. Well, if there's anything that you come up against that you're like, oh, we tried to do this, but we got this response or how would we handle this? You know, email me, let me know, because I want to hear these things. I want to help. But trust me, other people are having these same same issues right? And likely we're just too much in our heads about it, or we're too close to our cause, or we're too close to the people to really think of like an objective response. And that's what I can help with, because I don't know your people. You know, I'm not in the weeds of it every day. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. All right. Well, you go out there, have fun playing with Canva. Okay. And I'm really excited for you. Thank you so much for being on. Yes. Thank you so much for having me, Rebecca. This has been awesome. Yay! Thank you. I'm excited for you. Thanks. All right. Thank talk to you later. Take care. All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. These are going to be our live sessions. So if you want to be live on air with me and you want to just actually get in there and work on your funding proposal or work on your mission statement or work on your one pager, make sure that you head over to forpurposelive.com slash live and you can fill out an application and you can join us here I can't accept everybody, but if you have a good enough application and I think that others can learn from the work that we do, then let's have you on here and let's just, let's do some working sessions so that we can show you like, this isn't that difficult, but sometimes you're like isolated. Sometimes you're just sitting there in a bubble, in a vacuum. And it would just be nice if you had a person that would like bounce some ideas back and forth. And that's really what I want to do. Trust me as a business owner that does is a team of one, uh, it, it would be nice sometimes just to know I'm on the right track, even if I pretty much got it all figured out, right? Okay, so head on over forpurposelive.com slash live if you want to be on the show. If you want to get that one pager, you can head to forpurposelive.com slash page. And if you want that beautiful Canva template, like I said, it's 20 or it's seven bucks, um, forpurposelive.com slash store. You can head on over to forpurposelive and just check it all out. Okay, I'm excited to see you back here live. I'm going to try to do these every Friday as long as there's enough of you to help. Thanks so much for your service to this world. Until next time.